When you really think about it, the idea of disclosure has been with the UFO field since the very beginning, since we've known about flying saucers in the 1940s. And the question really is, will we ever have a moment in our world where this subject of UFOs is openly acknowledged by all elements of our society, including scientific establishments and political institutions? During the Second World War, 1945, when the first atomic bomb is detonated in history. We've never done this before. Are these beings interested in us because they see that we have unlocked this incredible secret, this major universal secret, that of the atom and nuclear technology? Why do the governments of the world feel the need to hide these objects that have been observed to travel at speeds that we don't really understand how they can move the way they do, stop on a dime, take off instantly. Why the secrecy? These are the great unanswered questions of the UFO phenomenon. Someone, something is in control of them. Welcome all anyway. We're going actually to be dipping into the, the hyperdimensional realms. This, some might say that this is the home of the shaman because a lot of this is non-physical. This is out of body stuff. Um, the, the, the difficult thing for me was to, to, to try and discern when I was in physical and when I was in non-physical because when you leave this planet and you go into dimensional, there really isn't any difference. This is basically from my age of five or six years when I started school. I lived in a, a little town south of Auckland, about 30 kilometres south of Auckland, called Papakura. Um, you'll notice a sort of an interesting looking trilogy we've got going here. Um, just for reference, the, the, top of the, uh, the top of the picture is north. So when I talk about the southern church, because the, the two north and south circles are actually marking churches at the entrance to the street I lived in, my house uh, where I lived with my parents is the, the smaller circle there. Okay, now, interesting thing. The first church, the southern church, was right opposite a park that I used to walk past on my way to school. In those days, this is for, uh, 60 years ago almost now, we, children used to walk to school unescorted, even at five or six years of age. Now, the second church that comes into play in, in, a, in a little while, I'll explain why that, that's part of the equation here. But anyway, right opposite that southern church was a, um, a park, a council park. And quite often, not, not that often, but maybe four or five or six times a year, I think from recall, not exactly sure how often, when I walked past that park, a strange light would appear. And within the light, quite often, there stepped uh, two small beings. The, uh, you might call them pixies or fairies or anything that a, that a five or six-year-old might feel quite comfortable with. There was never any fear involved. I can almost remember saying hello at some stages. And, and whenever I did, I was always handed something similar to this. I call, as a five-year-old, six-year-old, I call this a triangle box. I think you can all see it's a, it's a tetrahedron. It uh, had some markings on it, which obviously didn't basically mean anything to me as a five-year-old. I was always asked to look into it. I remember once I... I did and nothing happened and I wanted to hand it back and they said, no, no, have another go. Okay, now, we all know what, in, in sacred geometry and that, I, I won't go into this, we'll skip to what happened when I did look into that. I fell like Alice in Wonderland into another world. And, this, and I wasn't alone here. Um, there would be other children in this strange world that I fell, tumbled or walked into. And we used to play what we call magic games. Um, that we'd, we'd sit around in circles at times and uh, we'd have turns and the one that sat in the middle would be levitated off the ground by the other children. 
Interesting thing, back in 1995, after all of this, the dust had settled off my original experience, I went to fellow Kiwi, who, who many of you will know, Bruce Cathy, in his harmonic, uh, harmonic maths, and, uh, and deeper than that, it's a harmonic grid, I call them magic maths. I, I asked Bruce, is there anything specifically interesting about location A, where I had these childhood experiences? And uh, he ran it through his um, computer program, came up with a very interesting duality. duality. This, the point A is almost a perfect match for the visual speed of light and the electromagnetic speed of light. So close, in fact, that um, I've still got his original calculations here. There are 10 zeros after the decimal point. That's closer than a bullseye in, in, in anyone's terminology. Probably even the inaccuracy of the, of the placement of the map or the grid coordinates would, would be enough to throw it off by that much. So there was something very special here, perhaps with the right equipment. This was indeed a gateway, a door. Now, that might seem bizarre enough, but there's more. I always ended up, by the way, at the second church after that interaction, and uh, then I'd have to find my way home, slightly confused and not, not having gone to school and usually getting told off by my mother for wagging. Anyway, the other bizarre event that occurred at the same address when I was living in Papakura, and probably associated with Bruce Cathy's coordinates there, quite possibly anyway, was a recurring dream that happened three or four times a year for I was living in Papakura since, since I was four right through to when I was 20 when I left home. And always three or four times a year would come up this dream, so much so that I brought it as part of my memory. In other words, to me, this was part of my history. The strange events that followed, it's, it was located, I could always remember, in a group of... These islands were above water back in, back in those days. I could collate this event to being slightly after the so-called uh, dinosaur extinction event that happened in the Gulf of Mexico su supposedly 65 million years ago. And this event, while we were geologists in this dream, I was investigating not only mineral deposits in this area, but we were uh, eventually going to investigate this what was then a reasonably recent meteor strike in the Gulf of Mexico because the Earth, as a living entity, we realised in, in, in this dream, was sending out strange signals as if it needed to send antibodies to reject this intrusion into its personal body. Now, this dream... I just wonder how many of you have dreams that you actually see a mirror, so you can actually see who's having the dream. We all assume, I think, that having a dream, we are the same person in the, in, in the night as we are in the, day, in the daylight, if I could put it that way. But however, this, this dream had a mirror in it, strangely enough. And I was working as a geologist in, in the cargo bay of this, what turned out to be a scout craft or a shuttle craft which was being lowered down into the jungle from a mothership which was high above. I remember sitting in this craft and looking up at this huge pyramidal object above us. This is so clear and, and indelibly burnt into my memory. And, and I w my duties were to uh, get to ready ourselves for our landing and I had some cargo to, to prepare and I went down into what would have been the cargo hold of this, this shuttle craft and above me we had a huge parabolic mirror which we used for enhancing our light work at night. Strange thing was when I, when I looked up into that mirror I didn't see my face that I would have expected to see looking back at me. This was always the same entity staring back at me from this mirror. And I can, you, can, you can imagine I, I just, the difficulty of not awakening from that dream. It was quite a startling sight for even a five or six or a seven or a ten-year-old child having this recurring dream, not to see himself staring back in the mirror. And just a reminder that uh, we were now in dinosaur country. Now, 
our main main tasks were obviously to we were actually prospecting for minerals i believe and uh, we we would we had landed just prior to the evening nightfall in the jungles as you might know in the tropics get dark rather quickly and we were pre we were preparing our uh, parameter defences, which would have been like laser, laser lights, laser guns, warning devices, and, and maybe a few defensive mechanisms. And strangely enough, that dream cuts off at that point every time I had it, as if that might have been the end of that life sequence. And it's what you call death by dinosaur, quite possibly. Okay, now, nothing of any consequence happened for almost 20 years. And in 1987, I and the family, we'd been living in Auckland all that time. I'd had a couple of successful businesses and we were a little bit tired of, of the rat race of Auckland City. We wanted a different form of lifestyle. We wanted to get out of Auckland. And uh, funnily enough, in my childhood, Rotorua had drawn me like a magnet. I was pestering my parents all the time to take me to Rotorua. There seems to be something about thermal activity in my life uh, structure that, that is an ongoing magnet. I can't get enough of, of looking at and studying thermal activity. And of course, uh, Rotorua, as you know, in, in, in New Zealand, is a tourist attraction on a grand scale for thermals. So then the choice was, if I was going to live somewhere out of Auckland um, and, and maybe move into something like a tourist industry, we, we had planned to perhaps buy a, 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 a um, motel or something like that. We would, we would try it in Rotorua. Um, even in my adult life, uh, after I left home and I had my own transport, of course, I visited Rotorua many times. There is a connection between that childhood dream, my uh, geological occupation in a past life, and thermal activity. It's, uh, and uh, I think that many of you will know a lot of uh, extraterrestrial craft are seen around active volcanoes and even dormant volcanoes. It's a, it's a magnet for them too and, and there's a relationship there which I, I can't explain but it's definitely part of my experience. Now the re as, uh, we, we didn't buy a motel first off because that's a large commitment in finances, but we were thought we would buy a, a large enough house initially to set up a homestay. Now, the only real reason I'm going into to, to the, the detail here is because the car pictured in, in, in that uh, brochure of ours was the actual car that, that took the journey with me. So it's, it's a, a co-star in this edition of co-evolution, if you like. Now... Strangely enough, also at this exact time that I moved to Rotorua after being happily married for, for 15 or 16 years, as the family unit disintegrated as if scripted. It was as if it was time for me to leave this channel of, of life, if you like, for, and uh, in the end it deteriorated to such an extent that I... We had, I found myself having to leave the family unit. I was uh, going to go back to Auckland and uh, as a single man, if you like, um, and that, that represented the first opportunity in my entire life that I can remember that I could have spent 10 days out of circulation without anyone in any way missing me or reporting that I was not at a scheduled event or location or at home or whatever the case may be. Um, so that scripting of the marriage breakdown in Rotorua is almost like if you believe in life paths and uh, your destinies are, are written in stone and very little we can do to change them, then that might be an, a, uh, an experience of such happening. Now, that drive out of Rotorua, this is... Um, this is the Highway 5 in the Mamaku Forests. Um, the, the initial road out of Rotorua, a short distance away from Rotorua, is quite high up, quite rugged, as you can see from, from the picture. Now, peculiarly that day, it was, it was a summer's day, um, there was a strange cloud sort of formation came down and it became a thick pea suit fog and it almost happened as I was driving the car. Um, it was a drive I hadn't packed for, if you like, because partway through that Mamaku Forest drive, 
I had a strange sensation came over me, but initially it was like driving through an earthquake. It was like the, the car was just started vibrating and it was like the earth was shaking and, and maybe the earth was shaking. But to me, it just felt like the car was vibrating. And then it was like a ton of concrete had been dumped on me. I was just pushed into the seat and frozen. I couldn't steer the car. I couldn't apply the brakes. And unfortunately, the road isn't very straight. And eventually I was confronted with the car hurtling along at perhaps 100 kilometers an hour or more. Um, and a cliff face confronted me, and I couldn't use the steering wheel or the brakes. And suddenly, I wasn't in Kansas anymore. This is why I didn't pack for the trip. Now, as Duncan has alluded, I had no extraterrestrial ET, UFO experiences, so I had nothing that would, uh, would alert me to this being something in an ET range of events. This, to me, was death. I had crashed the car. I was dead. I didn't have a body when I looked down, and I wasn't in a place that had any uh, reality that we could relate to in, a, in our world. I was truly in no man's land. Now, obviously, I, f I was in a state of limbo. I don't know for how long. It could have been, I was even advised that it was probably about a day of Earth time while I was acclimatizing to this non physical reality. Now, when I did begin to focus, I, it was like being on a, a, an ice skating rink and lit from below. And in the far distance, I could see a, a glowing um, neon light effect. It was rotating, but it sort of kind of looked like a neon light blinking on and off. Now, The interesting thing was, not having a body, I was, but I had my consciousness because I was fully aware. I was fully aware of thinking about the situation and analyzing it. Why was I here? What was I doing here? And how could I either get out of the situation or how could I at least move to investigate further? I had to teach myself how to move without legs or even arms. And the interesting thing was that after contemplating it for a while, I just found by, by, by pushing forward with what would have been my head, or in this case, perhaps my consciousness, I could guide myself in the direction that I wanted to go. So that's your first uh, crash course in when you get to Barry's situation, Barry Eaton's situation, of how to move around in the afterlife. Okay, so now, in the non-physical, I felt a tap on the shoulder. And turning around, I saw two other uh, ghost-like entities standing behind me. Now, there was no communication that I could describe as communication. It was a sense of the things to do. And we were, as I followed these other entities out of this, um, out of this area of... Uh, non-physicality, I might say, I started to, to, to see technology that, that looked a little familiar, like earth machinery. Now, I was escorted, none, there's still no real communication, but I was escorted to strange glass-like tube device. Um, and even though, once again, there didn't seem to be any instructions, it felt perfectly normal and natural and the right thing to do that I should step into this glass-type crystal device. Um, one might think I'd been here before and done it before, and this was actually old hat, and it could be so, but I had no recollection of, the, of, a, of a previous experience, except that there was no fear involved, and the intuitive steps that I was taking felt well rehearsed and, com and within my own comfort zone. Now, the interesting thing while inside this glass tube was they seemed to manufacture a body for me because I can remember looking down inside this device and seeing my rib cage being formed. Now, that wasn't all they were making for me when, when they were building a body. We seemed to have adopted, even though my body looked to be similar, I was 40 years of age at that stage, similar body structure to what I'd had prior to the crash in the car, but it was now blue. And it was explained to me that um, with, with the blue body came an ability to interact. 
a communication device was was built into the body, if you like, um, and that that language was like something you could not imagine on this planet. There were no real words as such. We had a color which was accompanied by a resonance, but the resonance was more like a song. They were singing to me in color. And because all of this was internal, this was telepathic, obviously, even though I had never experienced it before to my memory and I, and I didn't realize what telepathy would be like, of course. I don't think many of us really do when it's full-blown. And accompanying these songs, these, these rhythms, these, these harmonic wavelengths, followed by the color, which was just flowing through my head, were images. And because this was being deciphered for me automatically, it was just like speaking to you now or you speaking to me. I, I, I would know what you were saying automatically. I didn't have to interpret it. It was it, naturally. It, it's, it, it looks and sounds to be so confusing to have colors in your head and, and, and vibrations in your head and pictures in your head, but... Along with that experience, it, it was they could download so much information so quickly, and it was all perfectly natural. Now, while all this was being explained to me, my head I was just so distracted with what was in my head, I, I didn't really take a lot of notice at, at, at who was communicating this information to me, or I don't remember, I don't recall it to this day anyway. But the next. The next entity, or I would call him a person, it's a he it or a she, because at that stage, I was confronted, I suppose, with what I would call, this was an, what was called an elder. Now, this was a very ancient person, if you like. The, the elders, I was told, lived for thousands of years. This was a member of an extraterrestrial race. The, the being that had been previously explaining what was happening to my body and what was happening with the interpretation of the internal telepathy was a hybrid of one of these uh, elder races. Just confronting him, the energy he exuded from his body was so uplifting. I mean, I, I don't take drugs, but I, I should imagine that uh, if I had a high on a drug of some description, that this was a very similar, uh, uh, it was a euphoric sensation. Um, it gave you, I think, great courage. It, it made you feel uh, well within yourself. It's almost impossible for me to, to describe the feeling that, that was emanating from this entity. It certainly wasn't fearful for me. And, of course, if you think about that image, I might have been preconditioned from childhood with that, memory, with that dream to be confronted one day with this entity and not be afraid. That's one interpretation of the dream. The other interpretation of the dream is I was one of these entities in that dream. But whatever the case may be, it's perfect symmetry for that dream to have conditioned me to meet this person and not be afraid. Although it was, seemed to be impossible for me to be afraid with the beautiful energy that the entity was, was sending to me. Now, the reason... This, this entity was introducing himself to me and um, there's been a phrase going around in, in the, uh, on the internet and with Duncan's friends and that just most recently, an acolyte unfortunately won't be here, that we should wait for the arrival of the silent elders. Now, if any entity had little to say and was matter of fact about it and, and short and sweet to the point, I would say the elders are very silent in the majority of their dealings. I only ever met them on the ship about three times or, or two or three times, and, and at each time the, the actual communication was minimal. But I have to say it was very strong because he was introducing me now to what he would describe as, as a guide. This person was going to be uh, my interactee for the rest of the journey. This person was uh, uh, one of the hybrid entities, which you might wish to know, uh, being exclusively bred to live on Earth. The elders as such, because of the state of our planet, the, the pollution of our planet, the, uh, the gross sort of proliferation of uh, magnetic and... Uh, I, 
electricity basically and microwave electricity and, and a lot of other pollutants on this planet plus just the the resonance of the place makes it impossible for the elders to spend more than about 14 days on the planet and they have to alternate um, when they're here they, they leave very quickly but these uh, hybrids are being built if I could use that word being bred being built being manufactured being born to live on earth now this is a deal that's been going on for quite a while with some earth governments but we'll, we'll get to that all in good time now I'll skip that if you think blue bio suits are far-fetched sci-fi sort of something you would uh, need to speak to the American government because they are earnestly trying to create a form of a, um, a polymer uh, plastic bioskin, both to go into space for ra for to uh, protect themselves from the radiation emissions in deep space, but also to uh, maybe work on some uh, poisonous materials on this planet that that are that are raising their ugly faces unfortunately which Duncan will be talking about a little bit later on but the US government is definitely trying to copy what I believe to be ET technology now this picture came out of a 1993 National Geographic so if they've got hold of it the US military will be 10 or 20 years ahead of what you're seeing here now Xena I, I, I called her Xena her Real name is Z5. Um, sounds like a robot. I wasn't happy to to be spending as much time as I needed to talk to a Z5. So I dubbed her with the name of Xena. It's not her real name, but it's it's, it's near enough to the um, vibrational frequency which would describe what Z5 is on Haven. Now, I think probably just, just to com compress this introduction of, of the original story down to a minimum, the most interesting interaction that, that, I, that I needed to partake of uh, with this entity and they were very keen to have me start on this program was uh, drinking a liquid substance which was their sole uh, nutrients. This is what all they ate. They never ate any solid food. They only drank what I would call a liquid crystal substance. I um, can liken it perhaps, maybe some of you are familiar with David Hudson's work. I think uh, Nexus did an article on white powder of gold many years ago um, where you can actually convert a, a, a raw mineral, a, a, a what we call a metal, into a crystalline substance simply by using excessive amounts of heat like an arc furnace. You can actually melt gold into a crystalline baseline uh, rhodium, any high spin state metals, any pure metals, into a form of crystal and then you can grind it up, put it into a paste or into a, into a liquid and drink it. This has been referred to by many as um, Food for the soul, if you like, for the higher self, for the light body, apart from feeding the 3D body, if you like. Now, this could definitely be a clue into interdimension, interdimensional travel because if you have studied David Hudson's work, the substance white powder of gold is interdimensional in its own right. It doesn't need a machine. You heat white powder of gold up and it disappears on you. And not only that, whatever it happens to be sitting in weighs less when it's disappeared. Cool it down and it pops back into our reality. It actually disappears into another state of being. So it's not so high tech when you think if you could build a, a craft out of that material, then you're halfway to interdimensional travel for a start. All you need to do is heat it up and it's gonna go somewhere. And then if you could, a bit of technology to steer it, you're halfway towards uh, dimensional travel and quite possibly this would include time travel. Now, interestingly enough, the bio suit was built out of the same material. And so now you have a, a synergy between the transporter and what we were wearing and then we were ingesting it as well. So what are you going to have here now? When you sw flick the switch to send your craft into another dimension, you're going to go with it because you're part of it. You're grounded into it. One of the other I would say, not necessarily warnings, but it was a clue to 
significant earth changes in, in what was to me then the near future, and this was 1989, remember. Zena said, well, you'll find some significant changes or some uh, points of interest will appear on your planet in, in, the, in the near future, and you should be looking somewhere in the Pacific in the area of Japan, and this, at this point she was pointing to an area south of Japan, but also slightly east of, of Japan. At the same time, she said at a similar time frame, you will be looking towards uh, the Bermuda Triangle, the Gulf of Mexico, and to um, areas in, in that field uh, for significant events. And then if we, we count the Gulf of Mexico oil spill as being a, certainly a significant life-changing event, Oh, certainly for anybody that lives anywhere near the Gulf of Mexico, I would say that that suggests to me that the time is now for some significant changes to be on, on the card. Now, there was also a rather toxic material which wasn't initially toxic. It was a natural uh, earth-based material. It had been... It, it, you'll find it in places that are where there's high pressure on the Earth's crustal displacements or tectonics. In, in these areas will uh, form a sort of a black liquid very similar to oil. But many, many years ago, the Earth had co catastrophic wars. And some of these areas had been booby-trapped with a form of nanotechnology, which could be released on the, the enemies of, of these warring parties, even from far out in space. So in other words, if you're going to lose the battle and you leave the scene of the crime, as I describe it, you can trigger automatically from out in space, perhaps, this nanotechnology to destroy your enemy in your absence. Now, there's more than one cache if you like, of this material around the world. And the point of interest here is that the, these people, these people from Haven that were uh, describing these events on Earth said, well, we had a base in Thule Island, which is in the, the South Atlantic, and we were researching this material that said it was preferable to do our research in cooler climates because if this material ever got away on them in a warmer climate, it would uh, multiply itself exponentially and possibly get out of control. So all of their research was uh, into this material was based in virtually zero temperature. Their concern at Thule Island, this is a seismic activity in the area of the South Sandwich Islands, which includes Thule Island. I just flicked that in to show that there's virtually an earthquake a day of some description in that area, and they were highly concerned that the wrong sort of earthquake at the wrong time would release this toxic material. Now, the good part about this is they were doing their very best to nullify this technology, and they still are. But unfortunately, we shall um, hear a little story about Thule Island in a while, in, in a little while, which uh, means that they've had to abandon that that particular base, which makes you wonder. And that was uh, due to pressures from our Earth politics. So it makes you wonder who is looking after us and who isn't at this stage. Now, the interesting thing about the another cache in the in the area of the Gulf of Mexico, but closer to perhaps Puerto Rico in the Puerto Rican Trench, which is a similar group of volcanic islands with a large uh, pressure point. Now, strangely enough, this relates to my childhood dream area, and I think that our uh, interest in this area may have even gone back 60 million years, so you wonder how long this toxic material has been floating around on our planet, complete with nanotechnology. Our planet's been populated, quite obviously, for millennia, and, and many more uh, races have been here that, since before the human race. Um, I just, while, while I'm on this subject, Wilhelm Reich has been, was a great uh, scientist back in the 1940s and 30s, and, and we're trying to work out who might be involved in the manufacture of this nanotechnology and who might have left it here. Who is an, a, a race that is so ancient that they've been here for, for millennia? Now, Wilhelm Reich was describing a, a race 
of entities that lived in a, in, a, in a parallel dimension to ours. They were fully capable of using UFOs to, to manufacture the leap from their dimension into ours. Now, he said that these entities could draw off the light from our planet and also draw off the energy from, fr from us as a, to bleed our personal emotive energy, I think is the right description. Now, when he started to to publicise his work about the, these negative entities, they uh, they got rid of them permanently through the use of bureaucratic systems that are set up on our planet. Um, we need to have a little look into the dark side here because uh, I, I want to explain to you that um, I've been accosted by a group of of, of uh, covert agencies and in, in league of the likes of MI6 and Duncan described the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Now, these covert agencies, you might be interested to know, are all run by uh, factions of occults in this planet. So in other words, the, the occult organisations run our covert agencies. Now, because our covert agencies are, are the draconian starting point, they're just the obvious places where what you might call black and evil events take place. And it's not surprising when you see who their masters are because even the, the masters of these occults are, of course, not the owners of the occults. The, the owner of an occult will be the being that they're going to be uh, throwing their allegiance behind. Now, Zena was very succinct in making sure that, that if I ever talked about my experience, that the world should know we're not necessarily in charge of our own destiny or the people that are in charge of us are not human. There is a drive of non-human need, you could also say, because these entities that, that these various occults, and by the way, that's uh, Bohemian Grove in California. Um, there's all the leaders of, 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 the, of the world have basically that are hooked into this, these entities have been seen at the gatherings of these clans. And this includes a, uh, what you'd call voted in politicians as well as members of, of all of the uh, covert agencies and the military especially. They have thrown their allegiance behind these, not just one entity but several entities because they give them a leg up, they give them a head start. They you would be, they may be uh, advising them on the future events on this planet even two or three days ahead, a week ahead. You can make an awful lot of money and become a very powerful citizen if you know the movements of the stock market, for instance, even a day ahead. You can make a fortune overnight. And it's interesting, I've always noted that people that are millionaires, people that are billionaires, they can have a, a, a bad guess, if you like. I don't think these entities give them a hundred percent success rate. Uh, well, they may be punishing them for not obeying the rules of the game. And you'll find the same people. They'll crash to the floor and the next minute they'll be a multi-millionaire again. I don't believe that's possible in a fair and even world. I don't believe anyone can make trillions of, or millions of dollars, billions of dollars from a fi that, that five minutes ago was a financial disaster. So there's something going on here. They, they've, they've got a leg up on us as far as finances con are concerned. And with, with money comes power. You can, buy, you can buy then more allegiances below you. Now, just as a... You will notice if you go down three, you'll find... This, this is a musical scale. This is a solfeggio scale of frequencies. Uh, the six sacred notes of the ancients. And uh, what I've done here is I've, I've converted the... Uh, the numbers that you'll find that me, you've got ut, re, me, fa, so, la, me, which is a, which is a, uh, a frequency, a harmonic frequent re, uh, resonance, and the, and the harmonic resonance is 528 hertz, I believe. Now, if you convert that to its base number, 5, 2, and 8 makes 15, 1 and 5 is 6. So now we have mi6, and you will note so therefore, I'm just explaining that the, uh, the covert agencies are well familiar with these ancient traditions and, and from the occult 
learnings and understandings of how you can manipulate people uh, using the realms of what could be actually magical stuff. Um, where, where does me come from? It's a um, mirajistorum. That's the, uh, Latin, the Latin word for miracle. So if MI6 is a miracle, but it suggests it's also a divine supernatural cause, that is the definition of a miracle. So you can use a divine supernatural cause to affect your will on the world. So here we have MI6, which is a supernatural cause, and you know MI6 is not doing anything good for us. So what supernatural cause are they following? You would be interested to note that most of this information came from Noah Webster, who of Webster Dictionary fame. Now, Noah was deeply into the occult. You might not know that. He was a Freemason of a high standing. And uh, from those that know, and I've, 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 I've dabbled around the edges of, of occult realities on planet Earth at some stage in, in, my, in the near past, and I found out, everyone says that there's only 33 degrees in Freemasonry. You get to the 33rd degree, and you will be at the top of the chain. Well, 33 is a 6, and everyone knows that 6 is not completion. Anyone know what the com completion number is? Exactly. So you would imagine that the highest Freemason degree is the 36th degree. And who would be at the, at the top of the 36th degree? the occult figurehead, which is not human. Now, there's nothing new here, but it doesn't hurt to know who your enemies are, said Zena, and also Wilhelm Reich. But Wilhelm Reich's not with us anymore, as he told one too many persons. Now, just interesting, we've been dealing in, I don't know, you won't all be able to see this, pentagram. Now, if you, if you tie... All of those frequencies that um, I had up on the, all of the, the nine, the 396, the, the 417, the 528, if you put them around in a, in, in a circle in numerical order and you, you tie the threes, the sixes and the nines together, you can draw a pentagram, which of course is one of the, one of the occult manifestations. Now, also, a guy called Nikola Tesla said, if you knew the secret of the threes, the sixes, and the nines, you'd have the magic of the universe. So this, this work can be used for good, but it can also be used for the other side. Now we, we're getting into the story, the history that was described to me from the, from the Havenites. This is the story of their sad, well, their sad history, if you like. It was destroyed, their planet, the original planet, which was outside the orbit of Mars, was destroyed by what they called bad science. This was an experiment initially designed to skyrocket them into a fast evolutionary track. It backfired and became their nemesis. These experiments included the use of uh, particle, they were experimenting in particle creation to build substances from antimatter. The reason for this was they wanted to go non-physical. When you go non-physical, you, you can the doors open to the whole of the universe because uh, faster than light space travel, you really need to be in the non-physical. And you can actually almost project yourself from any point in the universe instantaneously, but you cannot have a physical body. So you need to, 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 to step up one notch in the, in the creation of, of, of substances and matter. And they were, with the use of particle accelerators, experimenting in matter creation, which was non-physical in the terms that we would understand it. You might even say antimatter. Now, I can only say, beware the particle accelerator, because as you know, Earth science is just starting to experiment with exactly those things, and they're not interested in to see what happens when they smash an atom. They're interested in trying to create portals in time and also new forms of matter. So they can go interdimensional. Maybe might have had something to do with the last talk. This experiment into antimatter destroyed their planet. They moved temporarily to a temporary home called Mars. Now, if you know anything about Mars, one side of Mars is pockmarked with craters, only one side. An explanation of this might be that it was close to a very catastrophic event. And that may have been the destruction of its 
sister planet. Now, the people of Haven didn't really have a spaceship big enough to carry most of their population. That This was perceived this was going to happen by a large group of... of there was two factions on Haven. One of them were, were, were more sane, if you like, and the rest were more like humans. They wanted to blow themselves up. Anyway, the, the sane side of the community decided that, look, the only thing we have... Well, they went and captured an asteroid and they hollowed it out and they said, well, this will be our spaceship, this will be our ark. On this, we will put everybody we can possibly get off our planet and we'll go what was basically only a, a short journey to, uh, to the neighbouring planet, which was Mars. Unfortunately, when they destroyed their planet, they started a slow cycle of, the, of a rundown of the atmosphere and the water on Mars. Once Mars started to lose its atmosphere due to this ca catastrophic collision being so close to it, it also lost its water. So even Mars was becoming uninhabitable eventually. But uh, interestingly enough, that just as a side note on the way, Zena said to me that you realise, of course, that your moon is not original either. It's not of this time zone. It's not natural in any sense. I think we all probably know that. Now, the interesting thing about my experience, this happened to be in 1989, just when the Russians were sending a... a a probe to, Mar to well to photograph Mars, but they were pho it was called Phobos, the, the name of this probe. They initially intended to study Phobos carefully because it had exhibited evidently uh, remarkable uh, tendencies uh, uh, that it suggested that the that Phobos as a, a rock was not heavy enough. So the suggestion that Phobos was hollow had been on the cards for a very long time. And it's, and, and it's interesting to, to note, I think, uh, I think the Russians may be sending another probe to Phobos to land on it this time in the, in the next few years. There's something on Phobos that everybody wants to have a piece of. The interesting thing is that when the Russian probe photographed, they only got two photographs off before it was destroyed, they photographed, now, Phobos is 15 miles across or something, so they photographed this stick insect in space, which is quite obviously some sort of a spaceship, I guess, that's approximately 20 miles long. Now, I would assume that we are not making, or weren't making 20-mile-long spaceships in 1989. Somebody was in our solar system, and it's been photographed by a recognised government camera, if you like. So this is not faked. So when I say that there's something roaming around in our solar system in 1989, and I just happened to be, because I didn't know this at the time, could well have been some part of the equipment that I was on at the time. Who knows? Strange story they told me. How on Mars, when they created this ark, they brought with them a large, furry, hairy creature which was an outdoor being, very strong and very rugged. And then there were a group of small, high-tech, underground-dwelling people. And there was a race of reptilians on this other planet. These were the nutcase guys that blew it up. Some of those left the planet too, came to Mars. Now... Interesting, as you know, a side subject with Duncan has been the Solomon Islands mystery, Marius's book. Now, isn't it strange that um, we hear about strange Bigfoot, Yeti, Satchwatch creatures living almost in harmony with an underground race of beings that have ET craft or UFOs all seen to be living in the area of the Solomon Islands? Now, when I first told that history story of the, the Haven race about Bigfoot coming from Mars. You know, I was really seriously considering leaving that bit out of the book because I thought I'm going to, you know, if it's bad enough writing a story about extraterrestrial interaction without telling about Bigfoot coming from Mars because most people can't even comprehend Bigfoot existing anyway, let alone coming from space. And yet here we have 
a, a, a cave-dwelling Bigfoot living on Solomon Islands, according to Marius and friends I've been talking to. And they seem to be an accompaniment with uh, high-tech creatures that are living underground and, and fly UFOs. Now, if that's not confirmation. I mean, I wrote Coevolution a long time before Marius's book ever reached the, the light of day. So I can only suggest that um, we're either both crazy or there's something going on here we need to, we need to investigate. Now, jumping back to my arrival at Haven. Strangely enough, I was overawed when I saw the symmetry between, or, the, or the, virtually the reverse image. Haven was a small planet in, in, that, uh, that revolved or orbited around a larger planet, but the larger planet was as desolate as our moon. But the small planet was the one that had all the life on it. Strangely enough, that's sort of what I'm going to tell you about a little bit later on. Um, it will make sense to you when, when I get there. Now, we landed on this strange moon, I, I should say. Um, I'm going to condense this down a little bit because we've got a ways to go yet. This was, you could have sweared, that's, that's Egypt. I thought I, I thought I stepped out into Egypt. Well, these guys are conning me. They've just taken me around the earth and we've landed in Egypt. But these pyramids are not made of stone. They're made of plastic or glass or some dark crystal substance. Um, we exited. This is where we're still wearing blue suits, these bio suits we'd been fitted with for survival and for space travel especially, interdimensional travel especially. But on their planet itself, we needed something slightly different. And here we were, we were walked from the, from the landing craft, which is the, uh, that's actually much bigger than it looks. It goes underground. So this craft, it'd be three times as big as what you see at the surface here. It goes underground in this installation. We walked from there. Strangely enough, they walk a lot. They don't use much transport, but when they have to travel fast distances, they sort of teleport. But anyway, so, so they get as much exercise as you can, I suppose, by walking. Anyway, we were taken from that craft into one of these crystal structures, because these are not pyramids like we have on Earth. The, this is actually more like a high-tech hospital. This was where we were, were fitted, actually. The blue suits were removed, and we were fitted with a similar item, but this was gold. Um, or of a gold structure, or it had gold in it, or, or of some, some chemical relationship to gold. The reasons that this was described to me is because there was intense radiation on this planet. They have uh, a red sun, a dying sun, and it's blasting the planet. You might have just heard a, a similar talk an hour or two ago with intense radiation. But uh, they're far enough away that they can survive that. But the, the interesting thing is this is an artificial planet. This isn't, this isn't a planet constructed, if we might say, by nature. This is a planet constructed by these creatures. I've just done a, a close-up drawing of, uh, of what the hospital, if you like, looked like. Very few glyphs or very few words. I mean, as you know, this, this, this is a language of telepathy, so they don't write the written word down very often. If, it, if there's any instructions, they're minimal. Um, interesting, these were the only glyphs that I can recall, but just the relationship between the, the uh, chevron uh, uh, insignia, which was ab above the door of every pyramidal uh, building. It's interesting that um, NASA has ad adopted the, the uh, uh, chevron as their space insignia. You might, if you go through NASA's uh, website and have a look at all the NASA badges from the ages past and their, and their most recent one, there's always a V-shaped chevron there somewhere in their insignia. I, I just don't know about the correlation between uh, these people and, and some NASA projects. But interestingly enough, some other person that, that saw this some time ago said, do you realize that, that, that the chevron insignia was the only known glyph inside of the Giza Pyramid. It's the only official glyph that anyone has ever identified. Now, I've never been able to confirm that, but I'd be interested to hear from anyone that might have studied up on the Giza Pyramids and if there was ever a uh, chevron-type glyph involved in, in, in that uh, building. Now, I can only approximate what I saw. 
This was a very desert-like planet, very uh, dry and barren, and, and the only plant life of any, in, of, uh, of any quality was being grown in, uh, in very sheltered areas because this is a desert, and it also gets very cold at night, as, as our own deserts do, very hot in the day, very cold at night. Now, I think probably the most spectacular memory of that trip would be their housing, their accommodation, their dwellings, which are not built, they are grown. And they're grown from a, a mix of animal and vegetable matter. Uh, I believe they're built on some sort of an electromagnetic grid. Um, I never saw the actual construction, but it's honeycombed. When you get up close, even though on the diagram you'll see that the honeycombs are big, I just put that on to show the, the basic uh, structure. But the, the honeycombs are very small, very tiny, almost li like a beehive, uh, like a, a bee comb. Um, all of this, you'll see the Fibonacci type spiral once again. This is, these buildings were spiral. So when you go inside them, they look more like this. And at the same time, they're, 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 they're built and they have a mother of pearl resonance or, or, or sheen on the inside of them. Now, when you, when you relate to these buildings, and they do relate to their buildings as if they're a family pet, when they, when they, leave, or when they return to their dwelling, they've been away, they greet it as you would greet a living entity, your dog or your, your cat or whatever pet you might have at home. They communicate with it. They talk to it. They, they stroke it, if you know what I mean. Um, there's a relationship here with, with all of their machinery and with all of their structures. I never saw anything on Haven that was uh, non-biological, that was not a living entity. And because of that, they have a, an ability to interact uh, in, a, in a mental capacity. Be, and because this is a living creature, it will accommodate your requests. If you want the room dark, you think you want it dark, it will be dark. If you want it bright, it will brighten. If you want to look out, it will open a port for you. This is, and, and, and the, the way in which it's done, the, the sculpturing, everything's smooth and flowing and, and quite beautiful to, to the eye. There are no blocks on Haven, if you like. There are no square buildings. Now, interestingly enough, few glyphs that they were, they did have a number sequence, which I sort of learnt and f forgotten over the last 15 years, but I've gotten written down, so I remind myself every now and again. But there was one insignia. This is their national, their national insignia, which was uh, an incomplete circle and within the circle was a triangle the, this because it was their national sort of emblem it, it was to remind them of something and the incomplete circle was an incomplete evolutionary event remembering back that on their original planet they had tried to leap off into a, a new evolutionary step to become non-physical so that they could access time and the fourth, fifth, sixth or ten dimensions, whatever might be necessary in the non-physical. Don't seem to be able to do it in three-dimensional. Um, suddenly struck me that what I was looking at was this, which I've seen on Earth. Some of you will be familiar with Richard Hoagland's work and 19.47 um, degree latitudes. Is when you put one of these inside of a globe, it touches the edges of the globe at 19.47 degrees latitude. This is, within our planet, a doorway, a gateway. The, at these points, even though they're spinning, you get gateways and doorways opening. Our planet communicates with the outside cosmos through gateways and doorways at these sensitive areas on the globe, I was told. And the representation of that triangle within there was actually representing a tetrahedron. And of course, the pyramid or the tetrahedron shape was what they were using for dimensional travel. So there's a definite relationship there between those shapes. As we know, geometry is everything. That's the relationship there. Now, when I was scrolling through some, some pictures to present to you of like buildings on Earth, this is a mosque in Baghdad. How... <laughs> the other is a, is, a, is a rendition of a, of a tower I saw on Haven. I just... The similarity is just stunning. Now, 
Also, I was haven it for two nights, I think. Um, they build these towers. These are half mile high. Uh, but the same amount of structure is under the ground as is on top. Now, I, I first initially thought they were, they were broadcasting energy through the, the glowing balls on the top. But in actual fact, I had that around the wrong way. They were drawing etheric energy, if you like, from the ether, from the universe, from the cosmos, channeling it into the planet because that was what was keeping their planet in one piece. And these towers at night, they, they just disappeared off over the horizon. There were dozens of them, as far as the eye could see, about half a mile, a mile or so apart. And there were dozens and hundreds, no doubt. They stretched out of my sight. But it was a stunning sight at night to be outside and see something like that glowing in, in, on the horizon. Amazing. Now, this is also another just a picture I plucked off the internet. To give you a feel for everything being rounded, it's, it's, I don't know how you feel about it. I just feel more friendly if I was living in a house like that. I, I look at square block houses and they, they sort of like they do horrible things to my soul and they just don't look right. They're, they've got sharp edges. There's bits and shards of energy bouncing around inside of them all um, uncoordinated and they're... they're they're not good for you. Feng Shui, as you know, is probably trying to balance all that out-of-balance energy in a square house. But why, why build them square in the first place? Why not start off with something that's harmonic and um, solve, solve the problem? Now, also I got a very quick tour of the desert. The place was very inhospitable. Nothing, that, nothing there that I saw that uh, would make me want to stay there. Sites like this I saw all the time, it, um, but I was taken out into the desert anyway because just to explore the planet. Um, the, any vegetation that I did see was sort of robust stuff, uninteresting as far as like earth trees might be concerned. Um, the base of all the trees were quite stumpy. These were very short if this isn't the real thing, of course. But the ground was even more interesting because it was full of very sharp shards of crystal type material, very similar. I noticed to what the, the, those pyramids were, were like, were built out of, that we went in to change our suits. It was like a, a glass or a plastic-like material and, and um, very sharp. You had to be very careful what, what you did when you were in the desert. If you'd fallen over, which I did once, you'd do yourself uh, a lot of harm. Anyway, look, I've just condensed that down. Um, I had to, I spent a total of about three and a half, I think, Earth days on, on Haven. You need to read the book to, to get the full effect of that, what, what it was about. But, of course, now I, I had to leave. I, I, actually, it was quite difficult to say goodbye, strangely enough. I was offered the opportunity early on to stay. They expected me to stay. They thought I was crazy coming back here. Uh, given the opportunity to be with them or coming back to face a life with fellow earthlings, they couldn't see the logic in it. Anyway, I'd become addicted to this planet. I may have had several lives here as a non-human, who knows, but um, this time I'm definitely human, don't worry. Um, I have fallen in love with planet Earth. Um, whatever is in store for us in the near future, I want to be here for it. Um, maybe we can nurse it through some changes together, and I thought, um, good or bad, I I'm going to ride this to the end. And I've got some really good positive vibes about how we may be able to get through this. So, um, and, and, and maybe meditation is one of the, the places to go to help our planet. I don't even know whether we're going to have a rough ride. Who knows? I mean, it seems to me that nobody's absolutely sure. You'll hear a different story, I'm sure, from everybody you talk to. So I'm here for it, good or bad. Now, same story in reverse, coming back onto planet Earth. Continued the drive as if nothing had happened. When you come down here, <laughs> stripped of all memory, it's like a, a, uh, the old magnetic uh, videotapes where you um, 
put them close to a magnet or electrical field and you can wipe the information from them and we do come through electromagnetic fields as you know and radiation fields into planet earth it seems to be our our consciousness is stripped of our uh, higher selves memory and maybe that's part of the contract because if you're living a life here to learn a lesson as barry's been saying um to know all your past mistakes and why you're here sort of takes the fun out of it so anyway here we are Finishing that drive from, from Rotorua without actually realizing initially that 10 days had gone by, but it wasn't very long after that that I started to do these strange doodles at night in the day. Just whenever I was not consciously thinking about much, I'd be drawing these strange looking shapes, sizes, and, and beings, um, not being fully aware of just why I would be doing that. But as Duncan's told you, the car didn't travel very well. Um, I'm a reasonably good amateur mechanic. I've been in motorsport a bit in my earlier years, and, and I've had to build my own race engine, so I know my way around a car fairly well. And uh, when this car started to have those problems, I started fixing it. I was, oh, it's just getting to that age. It wasn't that old at the time. It's the 1980s. Um, needs a bit of tender, loving care. Um, but I just fix one problem, and the next one would occur, and the next one would occur. And as you imagine, I just moved up to Auckland. I was now living on my own. I was batching and trying to get a life together. I did not need a car that every second day needed a major repair. So I just stitched it up as best I could um, and sold it to the first unsuspecting customer that came by. Um, unfortunately, that might have that might not have been a good idea in the end. But at the same time, and this is one of my own personal photos, I was having uh, uh, unregulated, I might call it, out of body experiences. I, I would go walk about at night. First thing I did when I when I um, came back, I went and brought myself a crystal, uh, a, a, a quartz crystal. I don't. I've never. I'd never had a crystal before in my life. I didn't. I felt compelled to go and buy one. And not only that, when when I looked on the seat next to the car, when we had uh, when I materialised back into this reality, were two small pyrite crystals, two square uh, pyrite crystals that had a. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, they were identical in shape, uh, except one was a, a little larger than the other, but they had the same protuberances, the same uh, faults in them, if you like. It's, I've been told that's almost impossible for uh, a crystal to form and be identical, like sister crystals. Um, even though all crystals do form in a similar manner, they are never, ever identical. So this, when I went out of body, whenever I happened to be wearing this crystal, it would leave these strange marks in my clothing and a lot of people have been astounded by that and can't really explain it. There seemed to be some electromagnetic discharge from the, the crystal into my clothing whenever uh, I would go out of body at, at that, in that point in time. Now, the first, I can remember, I can definitely remember the very first time this happened because it was like a three-stage affair. I was watching myself from this. I was sitting beside my bed while I saw my body rise out of my body and at the same time I had the, the, the sensations of accelerating at a tremendous speed up into the sky. So you had the exhilaration of, of the feeling of movement while I was watching detached from the side. Now I can't explain that either. That was the very first time I went out of body that I could remember. And I just went up into the stars and had a look around at the night sky and, and the stars were so stunningly brilliant because I, I, it appeared that I might have been up in space perhaps. But it, this was uncontrolled and, and unregulated and uh, it happened spasmodically but I was never, uh, never sure when it would happen and I could never control it. Here is the, the, the pyrite crystal, or one of them. Strangely enough, soon after this event occurred, and uh, I think one of the crystals was stolen from my flat, certainly some of those doodlings and drawings, they went missing too. But maybe not, because most recently, the other pyrite crystal has just left me. It's disappeared. Now, many people have seen it. I've photographed it. I've videoed it. Um, well documented that 
pyrite crystal existed, but I cannot find it now for, for the life of me. Um, maybe the, the second crystal disappeared a little sooner. I, I don't know, but, or maybe it was stolen. I'm not sure. I had a knock on the door from um, the establishment soon after this, and, and, and as he alluded, it might have been, I, I assumed it was being traced from the strange occurrences happening to my car, because certainly the questioning that was being, in, that these guys were conjuring at my doorstep was related to the car, or that was at least their entry into a conversation with me. Um, the first point of interest to them apart from asking about the high tension, the, the high, high voltage interactions with the car, that it, to, to my knowledge it had never been in, a, in an accident involving a power line or high tension cables or anything. But um, when, when I refused to cooperate, they, they, they pushed this picture in front of me, said, this is a photograph of your car's fuel, air mix, electrical circuit board. It is a mirror image of what it should be. How do you explain that? This is how this conversation started, but it got more and more intense as, as it went on, basically. Uh, as Duncan's once again alluded, he's stolen my thunder. These guys, I, I, um, when he flashed an identification card, it was a DSIR. The DSIR in New Zealand was another company, another grouping that has changed its name most. DSIR was the D Department of Scientific and Industrial Research in New Zealand back in 1989, 1990. Uh, on the other side of his leather folder was a, a royal crest and something to the order of Royal Institute, International Affairs, etc. Now, if we trace the Royal Institute, we get back to, guess what, MI6, uh, our friends from Chatham House. Now, Chatham House as I say, now exists. This was just before my event, 1988. There's a picture of Reagan speaking, and uh, you might recognise a few people in the background there. Anyway, Margaret Thatcher, I think. Um, the, this is supposed to be a think tank. This is a private think tank, supposedly. Royal Institute. What a load of garbage. Anyway. Every good story needs Mr. X. Trying to shake off those, um, those scientists, I, I moved four times in six months. I tried to slip off the grid. They keep, they just turned up. I, I don't know whether I had a tracking device or some plant or whatever, but uh, I couldn't escape from them. There was a tremendous amount of heat on me in the late 1989 and going into 1990. It actually got worse uh, in, in 1990 than it was in 1989. Now, I did not know what was going on in the world outside of my own small nucleus. Of course, not many of us do. There were events happening beyond the scenes that Mr. X knew about. Mr. X is a, what I call a spook. He's, a, he's an intelligence agent from South Africa, and uh, he's not acolyte to my knowledge but I haven't yet met acolyte and none of us are going to get that privilege by the sound of it he was to be the next speaker or he was to be the previous speaker um, but this just happened coincidentally to be a South African agent I think there's more going on in South Africa than we are led to believe in the covert agency departments like particle accelerators that nobody knows about and alien recoveries that nobody knows about. I need to, to, to take a, a step back in time from meeting Mr. X, because he filled in a lot, of, a lot of gaps for me and explained why so much heat was going on at that time. Mr. X told me, you'll note the date on this, it's 1982, it's not 1989. There was a crash in the Kalahari Desert. From it was recovered. I should actually explain why it crashed in the Kalahari Desert, perhaps. This was a diplomatic vehicle, a genuine diplomatic vehicle. This was a craft from Haven. 
This was from Thule Island. Thule Island, as you know, was an alien base. Now, in 1982, you'll also be aware we had the Falklands War. The Falklands War was certainly about oil under the Falklands, but it was about a whole lot more. Because um, in 1989, I mean in 1982, the Argentinian uh, government started to flex their muscles, you might recall. They, st they thought that they could take on the British military. Now, the Argentine military actually built a base on Thule Island. They built a laboratory on the surface, and the extraterrestrials built their base deep underground because they were researching this black liquid underground, obviously. Military top brass, for some unknown reason in Argentina, got they thought that these ETs would help them out, but uh, they didn't realize that the ETs are not going to get involved in anyone's war on this planet. Now, they raided not only the Falkland Islands, but they bombarded and destroyed the space on Thule. And they removed articles from Thule and took them back to England. But in that diplomatic craft, that escaped the bombardment for obvious reasons from Thule. It was heading to a safe haven. Now, Mr. X didn't know where a safe haven might be for this craft, but I did. But when he told me where it was shot down and I drew a flight path, this is Thule Island, by the way, it's just a, this is a group of three, two or three islands, this particular one, triangular-shaped one, strangely enough, is called Thule. But um, we all know what happened in the in the Falkland Islands War. And the, this craft was actually shot down in the Kalahari, but the thing is that um, they went and got it back out of there from the South African side. When I drew a flight path from Thule to Safe Haven, which would have been in Tibet, I knew that, Mr X didn't know that, the flight path is directly over the Kalahari. So it sort of validated his story because I was dealing here with a a spook from an intelligent agency, which I had actually started up a rapport, a friendship, but I never entirely entrusted his information because he might have been trying to milk me for a likewise. Anyway, may have been shot down with a laser. We don't know. Now, this is the reason I'm relating this. This is the most dynamic story you'll probably ever hear. This has got repercussions. This story isn't finished. They recovered from this. There was also the false flag story floated out in 1989 to, tr to lead people off investigating the 1982 event. Quite often they put false flag stories out. UFO investigators go rushing off. Seems to be legit. And it comes to a dead end of investigation. No one was investing, investigating a UFO crash in 1982 unless you're on the inside. Anyway, Mr. X's information suggests, this is his information, not mine, there was a very special type of generator device that once placed in Earth's energy fields could generate enough power to run a small town even though the device was hardly bigger than a laptop computer from all accounts. It appears that even though many ET craft or UFOs, as you might know, have been recovered over the years, None were equipped with devices exclusively designed and run in conditions to be found on planet Earth. From what I have been told, none will run without ET input. In other words, take away the ET personnel and the device will shut down and not run. This device, however, was designed to run non-stop with or without ET personnel to tend it. Mainly, it was the power source of an ET base in Thule Island. It was designed to keep the base powered up, because they were dealing in some pretty nasty products in there, even if unattended. This is not your everyday type of ET cargo, and a very great prize for all the wrong reasons. Fact of life. Oil companies have a large reign on the direction of Earth politics and policies. Those connected with the oil revenue particularly own the world. They have the muscle to push anyone in the direction of their needs. I don't think you need to be told that. When the parties involved in the downing of this ET craft discovered what they had on their hands, there was such an international bidding war going on like you could not imagine. Who do you think might be able to win such a bidding war? 
And who do you imagine has the most to lose if a device like this made its way into the international market? Okay, Saudi Arabia. Okay, they are the biggest oil producing nation back then. They possibly still are. They were the top bidder. Prince Fasal, the son of the then King Fayyad, was reported to have personally picked up this item with a heavily armed guard, guard called the RGR, Royal Guard Regiment. He took it back. We're cutting this short now. <laughs> you really want to know about this. Okay. When you win a bidding war in an international auction and you're dealing with COVID agency, you don't necessarily get to keep the item. Mr. X informed me that there was a, no doubt more than one, CIA asset working in Thailand. For them, you don't know, there's a lot of Asian workers go up to the uh, Arab nations to earn money on the side. Um, obviously, the CIA uh, would have a few assets up there, especially in these rich oil nations. And anyway, supposedly, this is now we're getting into mainstream media. Now you can check this out. A Thai gardener was reported to have broken into Prince's safe using nothing but a screwdriver. He relieved not only the Prince of the... Uh, we'll skip on to... This is the Blue Diamond affair. He stole the device, of course, but lo and behold, when he, when he levered open that safe of the richest man on earth with a screwdriver, there was $20 million in precious stones, including a Blue Diamond, which was worth millions of dollars in its own right. The Thai gardener then just simply shoved them all in a bag and skipped out of the country and went back to Thailand. Yeah, right. Trouble is, the device and the blue diamonds, which should never have been stolen in the first place, the CIA asset, had been ordered to steal this device only. Eyes bigger than his belly, he saw all these glimmering rocks and he decided, well, who knows, what the hell, I'll take these as well. Unfortunately, that really, that gave the Saudis a, a, a legitimate reason to come chasing him. As I said, this event... Unfortunately, an alien device from Haven on the open market, being stolen, being brought down to Oceania, 1990. Who might have been on their books, covert agencies, people dealing with Havenites, rogue elements, person named Alec, perhaps he may be on the receiving end of this device to give back to its rightful owners can't take the chance that he's not. So they had to make sure that they could get me in a big way, so they set me up in a sting operation. We won't go there. They ended up getting me into prison so that they could initially raid the place, strip, my, strip everything out of my home, turn everything upside down, looking for not diamonds, obviously. Ended up in an unfortunate situation. It took two years for them to fulfill this promise. Uh, blackmail, if you like, you talk to us, you declare this item, you tell us who might have it, you give us some information to do with this deal, and uh, we'll make all your problems go away. I didn't make all their problems go away, but I got a few of my own. I ended up in Rangipo Prison. Mr X comes to interview me. He was interested in some devices that they'd removed from this initial wreck too. He showed me some alien artifacts, including small item about the size of a matchbox as a simulation. He wanted me to interpret the hieroglyphs. He also asked me what I thought it was for. Interesting thing, when he put the small item down, the shadow of his fingerprints remained on it. And uh, I asked him where he got it from. I said, look, if you want me to interpret what this is or what it might be for, give us a clue. I'm not a mind reader. He said, well, we got it out of a craft, and it was beside a crystal tube. And as soon as he mentioned that, and I went to pick this item up, it's just like I'd been punched in the head by a prize fighter. I Suddenly, my head was full of information. I just about fainted. I, from that interaction, half of co-evolution was written that night. From my total recall, it was just downloaded. I just sat up all night with a pencil and paper and wrote the detailed memory of my experience. Yeah, thank you very much.